This conference so, will now be recorded. So yesterday we have seen the Route 53 section, right? The theoretical part of the Route 53. Right. And apart from that, we have also seen the Beanstalk, Kinesis, the theoretical part, CloudRail, and CloudWatch service practically. So can you just recall me all the uh, routing policies of the Route 53 that you remember? Yeah, so routing policy, uh, there was a couple of them. One was uh, geolocation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then there was one uh, latency. Correct. Yeah, that, uh, and then one was like the weighted one based on the traffic, like 80%, 20%. Exactly. Uh, and there was uh, one more like uh, simple, simple routing. Right. Yeah. There was last one remain one more. Uh, simple geolocation, uh, weighted latency, and uh, failover. Failover. Okay. Yeah. Simple is like when you want to connect one domain to one resource. At that time, you can go with the simple one. Second, latency based routing policy. If you are maintaining two different infrastructure in two different region, then you can have a latency based routing policy. So that people getting connected to your domain from different region. So whichever the region will be uh, having the lowest latency, they will connect to that infrastructure. So your customer will always get a low latency infrastructure, uh, low latency details of your data. Then the third one was the failover. That is you maintain an active passive uh, relationship between your two infrastructure. You have to ready infrastructure in two different regions or in the same region also if you have uh, you can maintain two different regions and then you specify which one is your active and which one is your passive whenever the requests are coming they will always go to the active one and uh, in case that active goes down due to any reason then the passive becomes active and all the requests will be diverted to the passive infrastructure then the fourth one was the geo location based routing policy that is uh, you specify a region that only a uh, People from this particular region will be only be uh, allowed to accept uh, to the request to your web servers. So that is based on the geolocation. And the fifth one was the weighted routing policy. That is, you define how much weight you want to travel the traffic to this particular infrastructure and to another infrastructure. It can be 40, 60, it can be 70, 30, it can be 50, 50, it can be any weight. So today we will. Uh, uh, see the demo of that uh, routing policy that how to create a uh, routing policy unfortunately we won't be able to test that connection because for that we require to have a multi-regional infrastructure ready and we also require vpn and uh, a domain name so in short we just have a look how to create a routing policy so can you see my screen now yes just I will say Route 53. And from here, this is my dashboard. And this, is, if you want to buy a, a domain here, you can just type it search here any kind of domain. Let's call demo.com. Check. So it will check whether that demo AWS.com is available or not. And it is not available, but there are uh, other uh, domains which is available. <clears throat> Let me check any kind of thing. Uh, that is also not available. So basically, you can just uh, check your domain which one you want. If you want this one, big data for data, you can just click on Add to Cart. And from here, you can choose how many years for the next, how many years you want to uh, buy this domain. So for per year domain, its price is $12. If you choose this one, that is uh, cloud for data .net, it is $11. I think the list one will be the 11 only. From here, you have a very big list, dot .co .dot uh, UK is $9. I think that's the list.
so you can buy in this way and whatever you do you click on continue you provide here all your basic details <clears throat> your personal details contact information and everything and then you will be redirected to the uh, uh, to the payment part <clears throat> now this payment that is a $12 payment you need to do it right now it is not included in your monthly billing and this is also doesn't come with your free tier so whenever you do uh, make sure you have all the things ready and you want to do it if you want to transfer that domain from your existing domain then you can click from here and again you can check which one you had so let's say uh, whatever the domain you have you can just click on check and you can click on continue then from your domain register where you have already registered they will send you a code it's just a four to five digit of code which you need to provide it here and within uh, 15 minutes to uh, four working days they will get transferred to uh, it will get transferred to your aws now once you have created your own domain or you have transferred your domain you get one hosted zone you automatically get one hosted zone here now hosted zone is what a hosted zone is something which is a container that holds your every record set that you will be uh, creating whatever the subdomains you have whatever the mailing transaction uh, if you are creating such kind of thing or whatever the record set you, you will create it will hold all the data for example if i purchase this classic.com then uh, from in this page in the hosted zone page i will get this kind of hosted zone here so i need to click on here and uh, just a second and these two types of record set will be automatically present there. One is name server and second is start of authority. That is NS is a name server and SOA is a start of authority. Do you remember what is name server from our last session? Yeah, we basically map the IP with the domain name alias. Uh, the name server is the top level domain that sends all the traffic to your uh, regional domains. That is, you can see here dot com dot org dot k dot net. These are the top level domains, and these are responsible for taking the incoming connection and sending to your custom domains, whatever you had under the AWS. Other pro, uh, other domain registry will also provide you the names, but there will be one or two, three, anything. But AWS provides you four name servers. Now, in case that AWS certified.com is not working, then all the requests will be sent to the 61.org. If these two are not working, then they can go to the co.uk. So you have four probability now. Uh, if you if one of them is not working, then it will be sent to the another one. And second is start of authority, which authorizes whatever the records that you create, and so it authorizes that part. So this is again provided by the AWS. You don't need to uh, work here. Now, before we start, I, what I will do is I will create one load balancer here. Uh, I'm not creating any EC2 instance and putting all this connection behind this load balancer. This is just for the demo purpose. So I'm just creating a load balancer. Demo one. Okay, so let's say in Mumbai region we have one load balancer and we have we will create one more load balancer that is demo 2. So we have created two dummy load balancers, right? Now, if I click on the Route 53 again, now click on creation of the record set. Now, record sets is like uh, if uh, here you need to provide a name. 
if you want to have a app.classic.com or mail.classic.com if you want to create a subdomain sort of it then here you can provide that name if you don't want to have any kind of name all the requests should be made to your classic.com then you can keep it naked that are of value now there are different types that is a type and uh, which is ip version 4 canonical name is like uh, you have google.com and google.co.in google.co.uk so all these things are trial, you know directed to your own original domain name so whenever you choose a c name c name is nothing but an alias name that is like uh, whatever the classic.com you have it is also mapped with this kind of domain so what will happen we will say www.google.com so whenever i hit to the classic.com it will be revert uh, it will be redirected to the google.com the canonical name and there are multiple types available based on your configuration for the mail exchange for the ip version six address tags pointer service etc based on your uh, use basically most of the time you will use the c name and the a type we still don't use this kind of this is for the high networking part so we always go with the a version now if you have only one web server running that is one ec2 server now what we can do is you can provide here the four, four digit ip address whatever the public ip of the server is you can provide it here and click on create right but if you have at one load balancer attached that is you have multiple ec2 instances running then you can attach it behind that elb and then here you can select the alias yes click on enter uh, just hit enter and from this one you will find all the endpoints that is the uh, number of uh, sc web and website endpoints application load balancer endpoint classic load balancer endpoint elb endpoint etc you have all these things endpoint so if you have four application load balancer endpoint so you will get all the four uh, details here somewhere how it's not giving us that option So it's not giving us the, the load balancer that we have created. Basically, the state is active. So if we have a application load balancer or any kind of this load balancer active, then you need to just click on that load balancer and then click on simple and hit enter. So right now we don't have or what we can do. I just create one EC2 instance. And then I will put this uh, EC2 instance behind our load balancer that is going to the load balancer and the target group. Let's see that the demo one, select the target, edit. Uh, it's, it's not yet. Okay. Click on our EC2 instance running, add to register, and save. Okay, so now, uh, now I hope we should have a load balancer here option. Okay, due to some reason we are not getting the application open list, but uh, once your uh, application is active, you will get here the list of all the things, and from then you can click on the routing policy that is simple but if uh, let us say failover and geolocation if you want to go with the weighted one you can define what weight let's say 70 percent and let's say this is all the traffic should be going to my mumbai region whatever the ip address is 192 150 or uh, i'll just copy this ip address So all the requests will be sent to the my traffic that is 70% of the traffic will be sent uh, 
uh, will be sent to the uh, this IP address. Now create one more with uh, let's say uh, you can have a different value here or you can attach different uh, load balancer and we have created with a 70 so this time we'll create with a 30 let this is my mumbai uh, this is my let's say to my us continent hit on create so in this way you can attach multiple values here and you can define your weight maybe 70 30 20 20 20 20 20 20 50 50 80 20 etc so this is weighted routing policy Then we have latency based routing policy. So you need to specify the region uh, where your infrastructure is located. Let's say AP South one, current first region, that is Mumbai. And whatever the IP, or whatever the public IP you can provide here, or from this allies, you can select the target. Now you can see we got two uh, application load balancer endpoint, the demo one and the demo two. Now I can select the demo one. So all the requests, uh, so for what will happen now, I have one mobile infrastructure and over which this demo one load balancer is attached, right? And for this, you need to have a, a target health check. Click on create. Okay, so this one will be created. Uh, for my mobile region, this load balancer is attached. Create one more and let's say, for the another one demo two again latency and let's assume that this infrastructure is created in us east one that is north virginia so now what will happen aws will have a complete details about the latency now if any person is trying to access to my uh, website from australia so definitely from Australia, uh, reaching to the Indian uh, infrastructure will be more having a low latency network than going to the US, right? So at that time, all the requests will be made to the Mumbai one. So whatever the latency they have currently, sometimes due to a network issue or bandwidth issue, there might be a more latency uh, in the closest region also. So at that time, it will check whether the in which region do you have that uh, kind of infrastructure and what is the latency from your customers to your application. And based on that, it will send the traffic. So this is latency based routing policy. Then we have failover, that is you make an active passive relationship. That is from here, you can select which one is your active and which one is your passive. And you can select uh, the endpoint that is the one endpoint, and you can say this is my primary. Hit on create again. You can create the demo to select the secondary and hit on create. So you have now active and passive relation. So whatever the requests are coming, will be sent to the active one. And if the active becomes passive, or the, then the passive becomes active, and the, your data will be sent to the passive one. So in this way, you can maintain. And the fifth one is the geolocation based routing policy. The geolocation is something like here you choose a region. Let's say uh, request coming from Austria is uh, can be sent to my demo one application load balancer. If I'm trying now to connect to my that particular uh, load balancer, then it will not send the traffic. I can say. And create. So all the requests that are coming from Austria will all be only be served to this elastic load balancer. Apart from that, others are not allowed. So these are the five routing policy that you can create and you can maintain your routing strategies. Let me know if you have questions. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. So now we we'll see the next chapter. That is a uh, uh, lambda. 
So Lambda is completely serverless application that is uh, on doing the application services first or Lambda first? Uh, we are doing the Lambda first. Then next we will see at the application. Okay. So there is already one created. So this is a Lambda dashboard. A Lambda is a function where uh, it's services. You don't need to create a service as like EC2. You don't need to configure which Apache server, which uh, platform you want to create. Everything is done by the AWS. Now, is a functionality or is a function? I didn't get that. Sorry, one second. You said is a functionality or is a function? It's a function. In our C C P P program, if you remember, we write a code uh, in the inside the function that is function main function this and function that right the same function we need to create here and everything that uh, we write in the code this to be under a particular function and what aws lambda does is it lambda triggers that function only the lambda is a function and it triggers to that function only whatever the code you have written inside the function will be executed lambda doesn't support your front end lambda doesn't support all the back end it only supports whatever the logic you have entered, whatever the processing you want to do. Uh, everything needs to be under a particular function and the function will be triggered so that it can be executed. So Lambda is a function. It cannot, so you cannot uh, upload your website content or you cannot have uh, the front end in the Lambda part. Now, uh, as like our EC2 instance, we don't need to create any kind of service. It's completely serverized. Uh, another feature is here is as this is a AWS managed service. So this has a feature of automatic scaling, which is inbuilt. Same as to our elastic load balancer, whatever the demand will be the there, it will automatically meet the requirement. It is completely scalable. So in the same way, the Lambda is also scalable. But here the scaling differs. As we don't have servers, so it's not create more and more server. What it will do? It will create more and more computing power, which means if I want to explain, So for example, we have created one Lambda function and the Lambda function, the computing capacity that is required, which you have defined, it is like computing capacity. Let's say it take, uh, let's say Amazon has decided to have 180 MB of RAM, MB of RAM and whatever the configuration uh, it has with the processor that is uh, default with the Lambda function. Okay. Now this is a computing capacity of your Lambda. Whenever you create a Lambda function, you get this kind of computing capacity. Now, if whatever the function you have created, let's say the function uh, just requires to, for the execution of the complete function, if it takes only 100 milliseconds, then for with the 128 GP RAM, of course you can have a 10,000, 20,000 of requests per second, which is basic configuration also. But in case if we have more than this, then what will happen? It will create a shards. Okay, so basically, whenever you uh, create a Lambda function, this kind of computing capacity is called shard. A shard is nothing but a compute capacity. And if doesn't meet the requirement, let's say if the utilization is more than its uh, total size, then it will create one more shard with the same capacity. Again, it will create one more capacity, and it will continuously add this capacity. So here we deal with a computing capacity that is called shard. So these continuous shards are continuously attaching to meet the requirement. So whatever the requirement is, if it is, it will automatically get added one by one. Same to our like EC2, we get more and more EC2 server and we scale horizontally. In the same way, this is a scale. Now this scaling is also horizontal. The difference is like, in EC2, we have additional EC2 servers, but here we have additional uh, compute capacity that is called shard. Now, this is something that is not visible to you. 
this is something that is uh, having the back end of the aws right then to create a function you can just click on create function and here you get three options that do you want to start it from scratch uh do you want aws blueprints like there are a lot of blueprints available you can use this or if there is a serverless repository available in your git github then you can use this kind of thing so we'll go with the scratch one or uh, we'll not use any kind of thing you can give your name and from runtime you can select what kind of platform you want to go that is uh, .NET, Go, Java, Python, Ruby, uh, Node.js 8.10, Python 2.7, 3.6, and there are multiple versions available. Let's go with the Node.js. Permission, that is now here you require one role to be created. That role defines that the, per, the permission which is required to execute this Lambda function. So create a new role with a basic lambda function. So this lambda function is nothing but a very basic one. You can have a look. That uh, it just tells that it can be easily, uh, you know, triggered to that function. So to which service you want? Let's say EC2. EC2 to have uh, access to your lambda function. So that part you can create. Lambda basic execution role. This is the one that is create log group, log string, log events. That's it. So Lambda basic execution role uh, execute this kind of soft things. So we we'll let Amazon to create a load for us uh, to create a role for us and create function. So here our demo function has been created and this is uh, your uh, editor where you can write your code. Now export.handler async event this is something that is written in the JSON language the, uh, no, in the Node.js script in the ja oh. JavaScript. I in the Node yes. So if you change the runtime here like from Node.js let's say Java so what gonna change here will the code change or will the environment just change the environment is changed now you can upload your code whatever you have uh, in your which is present in your local directory or uh, if it is present in your s3 basically if your code is longer than the 10 mp then it, you need to upload it to s3 and then you need to pass here the link of your s3 uh, object yeah, but the is, what kind of code what we're trying to achieve here like for example with the backend code that you write for your application server that you can only upload it here for example uh, in your front end there is an amazon website okay so whatever the you see on the amazon.com that is on the front end server that you have a dedicated ec2 instance for that now if a particular person is trying to uh, create a order then the creation of uh, that order, then sending that order ID with the respect to name, uh, address details, and how the payment is uh, done. All this information, if you want to create a uh, case and order ID, everything that you can process in this kind of backend service. Because this is a backend service, this is done at the Amazon side, right? So all this configuration you can do in your Lambda function. And once it is created, now you can trigger it to the DynamoDB so that all your data, uh, whatever the things that you have created, it is written to your database. So for your backend purpose, you can uh, change the runtime or you can uh, upload your code into the Lambda function. Okay. Okay. So again, we will uh, just change the Node.js so that we have our editor right now. And here, this is something that AWS has created the execution role when we let amazon to create a role for us this is a memory that is how uh, to execute your code so what kind of memory you require how much memory for per execution you require and the time of prior 
if you want to attach it to a particular VPC, you can select here. Now we have debugging and error handling. So debug is like if your kind of error is open, so how uh, it should react. So if TRI is continuously debugging option there, whenever a request a user is trying to request to your Lambda function, if it is getting error, so you can send it to your SQS, that is the application service, or you can post it to your no, push notification. So we you can configure this two part here, and the same error handling will be saved in this part. So whatever you have, if you kind of debugging or if you have uh, issues with the debugging or error, then you can put into your SQS for further processing or for sending the push notification to get notified. Now the very important part is a concurrency. So we have seen in this diagram that we can create uh, AWS will create automatically and add the capacity that is called shards. So how many shards you want per function or per uh, multiple functions you want? How far you want to this uh, Lambda function to grow? So all that part you need to define in the concurrency. So basically whenever you create an AWS account, you get thousand concurrency in your AWS account like per region you get thousand. It is not subjected to per uh, function. It is reserved for the entire AWS account that is thousand. So which means it can grow till thousand shards. This function can grow till thousand shards. Now if we have multiple function then if you want to be very specific that a particular function can grow up to only 200 concurrency then you can reserve your concurrency for this particular function let's say you have four is it uh, let's say you have four lambda function and this four lambda function this is the one that is this two. so you can define only 200 concurrency and that and the left one is only 800 so, so now 800 uh, concurrency actually doing here uh, okay, so first of all, uh, the reserve concurrency is like you reserve this 200 concurrency for this lambda function. Now you have unreserved that is 800, which can be consumed to the another lambda function. Now concurrency is something like here we can define this kind of this concurrency. That is number of shards you want to attach to a particular lambda function. Okay, same to our load balancer, we define the minimum and the maximum capacity, right? So here also we define the what is my maximum capacity. The minimum is always the least one that is one. But if it is trying to continuously grow, that is you are getting more and more requests. So how far you should want, uh, how long you want to uh, create that AWS resources for you. Because if someone is trying to have a DDoS attack kind of attacks in on your uh, AWS infrastructure on your Lambda function, then this will cost you a lot. That is if it reaches to the thousand concurrency, then it will definitely cost you a lot because you are going to pay for the hundred concurrency that you are using of having a thousand uh, sorry having a thousand uh, different computing shards available for you you need to definitely pay for that so here you limit the control that is if it is has reached to the 200 shards then it should stop now creating a new ec2 uh, lambda function and whatever the now new uh, temporary whatever the new uh, request you are getting above this uh, to meet the above requirement of both the 200 then they will get an error page that currently this kind of uh, service is not available so concurrency here you define how many shards till it should grow there is a maximum capacity for your auto scaling okay, okay. so one shard is uh, one concurrency that what you saying yes yes Okay, so it's like one shard is actually what? Like how much computing power? Is it like a one thread, one process, what it is? Yeah, one thread uh, you can say. And each thread you can define how long this uh, CPU proportion you want to be maybe configured. That is minimum 128 MB and the maximum uh, 3 GB around. So this, uh, this kind of thing that you can define. So this defines your computing capacity for each Lambda function. Okay. Okay. So if you have selected, let's say one zero two. To one GB RAM. Okay. So one GB of equal shards. So if you have 10 shards running, that means 
your CPU consumption is 10 GB for this particular function. So based on this, you can define 128 is a minimum that you need to have a, into consideration. So once it is created, now the second is you need to test your code. So for that, you need to first create a config at test events. So as we are not having any kind of different Lambda function, we will have the demo one. So whenever I pass this value, value one, value two, value three, then I will get a response of welcome to Lambda or hello from Lambda. Create a case. So case is something that uh, whatever the configuration, whatever the code you will write, what should be the output of that code so that you can configure, you can test whether that your Lambda function is working properly or not. So click on save and then click on test. So our execution has failed and says unexpected token syntax error. And now here you can see the duration is 28 milliseconds. Now to execute this code or whatever the code we have written, it took 200 or uh, 28 milliseconds. But still the minimum for the minimum duration we will get bill that is 100 milliseconds. So memory uh, resource configured that is 128 MB and the maximum memory use is a 46 MB to execute this code. Now the what does the, is the build like? How how it charges the bill? Is it like uh, based on the function or is it like it's like same for all customers? Uh, this is for the all customer. How many uh, executions you have made, and what is the duration of this execution? So, for example, if you have consumed 128 MB of entire uh, 120 of 128 MB of uh, you know memory to execute one single function to execute one single uh, request, and if that request is for the next 100 millisecond or let's say for the one second, so one second into 128 whatever the price of that will be charged for you. So during this per second, if seven requests has been made, one request to, uh, to execute that one, uh, seven requests, if it takes 100 milliseconds, then 100 milliseconds into the amount of uh, memory that you have consumed, that is 46, you will be charged. Now, for we have requested only one request. Uh, we, we sent only one request, which took 28 milliseconds. But the minimum duration of uh, billing is 100 milliseconds. So we will get charged 100 milliseconds into the 46 GB of RAM, whatever the pricing they have, it will be get charged for that. Now, AWS offers you starting 1 million requests per month for free. So we have just sent one request. So similarly, 1 million requests every month for free, it is offered by the AWS. Uh, throughout the lifetime as of now and you and your infrastructure is exceeding that much limit if you are getting more than 1 million of requests then you will be only charged 10 cents for another 1 million request you can see the pricing of the AWS function and this is something that you can create now the last feature of that uh, this kind of lambda function is Lambda function cannot be called directly. Lambda as this is serverless, so it is not running to your infrastructure 24 hours. Whenever you register, whenever you create EC2 instance, you need to run for the entire 24 hours so that whenever the request is coming, it will be served. But as this is a serverless, so we are not running this demo function for the entire 24 hours. That's why we uh, get billed for the particular duration only whenever it is executed at that time only, we will get bill for that. Now, as this is a serverless, we are not keeping it active. So we want some triggers so that whenever this kind of thing, uh, event is created at that moment only, it will create and uh, it, will, uh, it will launch this kind of function. So we have triggers here, a lot of triggers like S3, SNS, SQS, uh, trigger, everything. For example, S3. So whenever an S3 bucket is being created, uh, or uh, sorry, whenever an object has been created, or whenever an uh, object is deleted, you can configure this part in the S3 from here. That is, which bucket do you want? You can select this uh, from the list of buckets. When you want to create this event, when all the objects were create uh, create complete, that is, put, post, copy, multi-part, upload. 
or when the object is deleted, when the uh, data is restored from the glacier, or when you want to create this kind of event. So you can select one of this event. Uh, if you have to put into, a, if you want to apply on a particular folder, then you can mention this name of the folder. And the suffix is if you want to be applicable on a particular file type .jpg .png in the entire bucket, then you can mention this part and then you can click on add. So what will happen now if you put any file on the S3 bucket, this demo function that is the Lambda function will be executed. So whatever the operation do you have mentioned that part will be executed. Now in a small example, a scenario. Let's say you have created a uh, job portal and whatever the uh, you, you resumes you get from your students that is directly uploaded to your S3 bucket. Okay, you have given the direct link to upload that bucket. Whenever user uh, uploads that bucket, it is uploaded to your S3 bucket. Now you can trigger this Lambda function that uh, you can you need to write a code for that. But as soon as this PDF file or the Word file has been uploaded to your S3 bucket, what it will trigger the Lambda function, and what Lambda will do, it will that it will read the file, it will open the file, it will read the file, and it will extract the data the name the uh, skills the you know the uh, the colleges that this person has been studied and the experience etc it will extract the data and then it will write it to your dynamo db table so here from here you can configure this dynamo db Uh, for that, you need to write first. You need to request here yeah, this DynamoDB table. If you create this kind of actions in the in the DynamoDB, it will be auto automatically be created in this part. So in this way, you can design your completely uh, serverless application. Now, if you have been uh, you know experienced with this kind of infrastructure, then whenever you upload any resume or uh, yeah, whenever you upload any resume you get a result you it reads the file and then you uh, you see on your browser that what is the in uh, what are the, what are the things that you have included in your resume is already present on the web part right have you ever noticed that part that whenever you upload a file uh, whatever the data you have it is being copied and you can and it is displayed on the in their own format right they parse the skills and other things from the right. resume automatically accept the parts and do all this configuration right and it will put into that their desired location so all the thing you can write a script for that and put into this lambda function you can create multiple files here again you get a complete uh, editor here file edit find view go tools window etc so from here you can create this kind of role and this kind of script and once it is triggered it will be written to the uh, dynamo db so that you will have a maintain of this copy and to your SC bucket, now you can create a lifecycle rule that a resume whenever is uploaded at that time, uh, it should be in the, you know, in the standard one. After 30 days, 60 days, it will be moved to the infrequent and then finally it will be moved to the glacier. This kind of things you can also do. Also, you can uh, initiate the SNS uh, notification that if you want to get notified whenever a new resume is uploaded, you can enable that future. You can also have a feature which is directly attached to your S3. And if you want to have it when a demo function is executed, you can add the part in your code. So this is all about the Lambda function that is a completely serverless and you can design with this kind of things. Now, whatever the AWS managed service you get in AWS infrastructure, use, you can use this service to design completely serverless application. Like you have an SNS to get notified to store the object you have s3 to process the backend you have lambda function then you have multiple services here you can see to create a cloud watch alarm uh, cloud watch events iot api gateway application load balancer whatever the request you want to send whenever a load balancer is hit it now you can also configure that part which load balancer that is let's say demo one listener at port 80 Host, if you want to have any kind of host, otherwise it will be considered as a www and port 80, and then add. So whenever a user hit to that load balancer endpoint, it will be triggered by this directly to this function. So that part is possible. 
So in this way, you can design your backend service with high availability and cost optimized solution. Any question? Uh, in doubt in this part. So Lambda is basically for backend processing, nothing else, right? Right, nothing else. Here you cannot configure your front end. You can design. You cannot design your website. Okay, it's just like. Uh processing the data which you are feeding in through s3 bucket or i mean s3 bucket is the only way to feed the data or is any other no, no, no. there are a lot of ways that from the api from the iot from application load balancer these are the all the triggers from which you can uh, trigger to this function okay okay so it's basically the events you are generating based on the events exactly. uh, this process a lambda is a function which can be only triggered when another function executes it. So if this kind of services ex trigger this lambda function, then only the lambda will be invoked. Lambda also has the capability to invoke other applications. Uh, this all application it can uh, invoke. Let's say from once the ST bucket, uh, from once the data has been uploaded to ST bucket, that lambda function will be triggered. And once so whatever the processing uh, it want to do, it will do, and then it will trigger to your SNS, SQS, or whatever DynamoDB it can. So Lambda has a capability to invoke other function and to get invoked when uh, other services uh, initiate the request. Now, as similar to other AWS services, we got a CloudWatch service for free. So AWS uh, offers the same part here, and you will find this is always attached to your Lambda function. So CloudWatch will be always a part of your uh, Lambda function. Okay, so like when we build a code pipeline, right? So all these services like code commit, code build, so we can all do it through the Lambda? Yeah, uh, basically code commit is only possible right now if you want to trigger a particular, uh, you know, whenever you have committed, whenever you have built a particular code, if you want to trigger at particular time, that is let's say at 12 after midnight, you want to uh, roll out a new future. So that card is currently possible. Only the code commit is possible at uh, by this time. Maybe in future you will get new features with the code build and code pipeline. Okay. Now with the Lambda function, as you cannot have a website, uh, you cannot design or you cannot showcase your website here. It can be only used for your business logic, for your backend services, for your application logic, etc. Whatever the backend you do, you can put it into your Lambda function. All right. Okay. So now the last part we will see is the application services. Oh, what's well architecture framework? Is it a part of it or separate? Uh, it's just a theoretical session, uh, oh. which is a list of all the parameter that you want to check whenever you want to design your infrastructure. So application services, first is SQS, that is a queuing service. Amazon SQS is a web service that gives you access to manage uh, message queues that can be used to store messages while waiting for a computer to process them. So until your consumer consumes this message, it will be always stored into your SCS. For example, Amazon.com, whenever you hit onto the add to cart button, you get entered into a queuing service where you get nine minutes or 10 minutes around to process your address details and the payment gateway. So until that request has been uh, processed by another consumer, it is saved in that queue. And every application goes under certain queuing system. So whatever the sequence you have got, uh, it will be followed here. Amazon SQS is a distributed queuing system that enables web service application to quickly and reliably queue messages that one component in the application generates to be consumed by another component. A queue is a temporary repository for a message that are awaiting process. So it's a temporary storage system where you can store your messages and it will be in the queue until a consumer consumes those messages. There is a retention period, but until the consumer consumes that, uh, that part of a message, it will be always in that queue. Now there are two types of queue. One is a standard queue and second is the FIFO queue. That is first in first out queue. By the, the default one is a standard queue. That is a default queue. You get unlimited number of transactions per second. There is no limitation with the number of transactions you have in a per second basis. Standard queue guarantees that a message is delivered at least once. Okay, 
whatever the uh, system that you have designed whenever the app message reaches to your queue it guarantees that the message will be delivered at least once which means there might be duplication in your delivery the same message can be delivered twice there is a duplication but aws guarantees that it will deliver at least once however sometimes more than one copy is delivered that is when so we what say kind of uh, message we are i mean saying here like message in the sense like uh, uh, for example uh, that amazon website or the transition messages that you do on the bank whenever you do some a certain kind of uh, online transaction that goes under certain queue where it checks whether the username uh, to whom you want to send the account number that is account number of that particular person is valid or not that is a code ifc code the account number and etc it goes to under a queue whether where it checks whether that all the beneficiary that you have added it is uh, it is true or not so this is a message that a process has sent to a queue to process this kind of messages that is a process has sent all this information to uh, as a message to a queuing system and it is in the queue until the consumer takes this request and checks whether the account number and the ifc code to the uh, to the recipient is valid or not so whenever uh, until the consumer to process that request you can put into the queuing system so a message from a processor whenever you have requested to uh, add a beneficiary uh, so a processor then writes a message to the queuing system and it writes all the data what about the uh, the details about the recipient account number account name and the ifc code etc details which is then stored in your queuing system now until the consumer consumes the process it will be in the queue when the consumer goes uh, process that request then it will be sent uh, it will be checked whether it is valid or not if it is valid then it will flag as one and so that now you can make a payment to that particular person if it is marked as zero then you cannot uh, make that payment whatever the uh, flag you define based on that okay a message can be anything whatever uh, this is up to you what message you want to define so it ensures that messages are generally delivered in the same way as arrive so it doesn't guarantee the standard queue doesn't get it the way that message is arriving it will be delivered in the same way there may be a jumbling but with the fifo queue it exactly delivers once so there is no duplication with the fifo queue the uh, the and the secondly the order in which messages are sent and received is strictly preserved and the message is delivered once and remains available until the consumer process and deletes them so here the message will be delivered in the same way as arrived and the second thing is it is delivered at uh, it is delivered exactly once so there is no duplication in this part duplicate are not introduced into the queue and fifo queue are only limited to 300 transaction per second whereas the standard queue is the number of uh, unlimited number of transaction per second right now very important part of a uh, sqs that is sqs is pool based not push based which means sqs whatever the messages you have in your queuing system you need to pull that request you need to pull that messages sqs will itself not push that messages to your consumer your consumer needs to pull that messages from your system did you get this part yeah yeah so this is very important a definite question is asked in the exam and in the interview that which service is a push base and which service is a pull base so sqs is always a pull based system and sns is a push based system this is a very common question asked in the exam second a message size that you generate a message size that is in the json language uh it can be a uh, maximum up to 256 kb in size message can be kept in queue from 1 minute to 14 days and the default uh, retention period is 4 days so this is a retention period of your sql system that you can keep your messages from 1 minute to 14 days and the default is a 4 days this is also very important from exam point sql guarantee that your message will be delivered at least once So now let's just have a quick recap of uh, these two queuing systems. First standard and second FIFO. Standard is uh, limited to unlimited number of transaction per second, whereas uh, the FIFO queue 
is having a three no, 300 transaction per seconds only standard queue guarantees that the message will be delivered at least one whereas the fifo queue guarantees that it will be exactly delivered once there is no duplication in the fifo queue but there might be a duplication in the standard one standard one doesn't guarantee the sequence of the uh, the sequence in which the messages arrive will be delivered in the same way but it tried to maintain the same thing whereas the fifo queue guarantees that the way the messages arrive it will be uh, listed in the same way now the common between the all the uh, queuing system is sqs is pull based system not a push based system a message size cannot be grow more than 256 kb in size generally the retention period is 4 days but you can change the, the retention period from 1 minute to 14 days and SQS guarantee that your message will be delivered at least once uh, by the standard one. Okay. Any question in the SQS part? No, I'm good. Okay. The, this SQS part is very important for exam. Uh, right now, if you check, if you have anyone uh, reference who has just recently given the exam, you can ask them that SQS is the most, uh, on this type of service, the most number of questions are asked. This is not a purely on SQS. The, they will give you a scenario in which the SQS will be introduced. Then we have SCS that is simple email service. Amazon SCS is a cloud-based email sending service designed to help digital marketers or application developers and to send marketing notification, transactional emails, etc. It is reliable, cost-effective service for business of all sizes to use mail service to keep in contact with their customer. So if you want to send a promotional message, if you want to promote your uh, product or if you want to make transactional email is whatever the transaction you do on your e-commerce side, in your banking side, uh, or uh, if you kind of do any kind of bookings, then as soon as you do, you get a notification, email notification. So that kind of system, if you have already infrastructure in AWS, then you can integrate this SCA service so that as soon as uh, the request has been made, you will get a transitional receipt of that part. Now, benefits of the SCS is high deliverability, cost effective, and configurable. High deliverability uh, because AWS needs your domain. So, whenever you, whatever the domain you have, you need to uh, you know configure once again on the AWS, uh, and it will create some records and in your domain. So, once it is created, uh, so that AWS maintains that whatever the emails now you will send, it should it will be always sent to your uh, inbox so because of this domain verification whatever the real whatever the messages that you will be now sending to to your customer will be highly deliverable which means it will be always sent to your inbox it will be not marked as a spam cost effective that is amazon gives you 62,000 email per month for free and after that also if you see the charges the charges are very minimum the second important feature that uh, AWS SES offers you is, is uh, if someone is trying to uh, respond on your mail, that is whatever the product, uh, you know, uh, marketing that you have done on your via email service. If I want, if I revert it on that mail, that mail you can receive on SES directly. So from SES, you can send the email and if you are receiving any emails, then also you can revert to back email and it is completely configurable you can change the parameter you can uh, completely change the way uh, your message should be delivered use cases these are the top use cases for most of the companies use for transactional messages for marketing communication send notification or receive incoming emails so all these use cases is very helpful now we saw the sms right sms is also notification for SNS, uh, is SNS is a push notification. So whatever the uh, the notification will be sent to you will be based on the Amazon.com. Okay, that will be sent from the uh, no reply at the red Amazon AWS.com. That will and whatever the mails that you will send via SCS that is based on your domain. If you have purchased this uh, example.com, then whatever the mails now we will send that is sales from uh, sales at the rate amazon.com or whatever it is it will be sent via that email so here you need to configure your email service first okay, okay. 
So these are the top uh, use cases. Like uh, I have worked for the uh, there is a company Shadi dot com and uh, uh, Ticket Now dot com. So both of these uses for sending the transaction mails and the marketing communication, they use this kind of SES service. And the third service we have is a simple notification service. Amazon SES is a web service that make it easy to set up, operate, and send notification from the cloud. It provides developer with highly scalable, flexible, and cost-effective capability to publish messages from an application and immediately deliver them to subscribe to other application. Now, the condition with the SNS is whenever a notification is sent to the SNS, you need to subscribe to that notification. Okay, whatever the let's say I have created one topic, and for that topic, you need to first subscribe. Uh, Basically, if you remember, whenever you sign up for any uh, social page or any blogging page, they uh, they they send you an email that you need to do a uh, you know email validation, correct? So that email validation is basically you are just subscribing to their email service, and once you have subscribed to that email service, now you will get a notification. This is this is similar to that part. Push notification, you can send it to Apple, Google, Fire, or Windows devices. You have direct integration with this kind of devices. Besides sending to mobile devices now, because nowadays mobile applications are designed based on the uh, you know computer response. Whatever you have on your web console, you will get the same console on your application app, uh, mobile application. So besides sending it to mobile devices, SNS can now be delivered via SMS, email to SQS. Or to HTTP or Lambda function. Now, just a scenario. Whenever you upload any kind of documents on any website, once it is successfully uploaded, you get one notification that your document has been successfully uploaded. Correct. So that notification is HTTP notification. That is, you send any kind of notification via over the HTTP endpoint. For example. If a person is trying to upload a resume on my uh, S3 bucket from the web, so once it is uh, once it is successfully uploaded, then my SNS, S3 will uh, trigger a notification via SNS saying that HTTP endpoint will get a notification that is it is successfully uploaded. All these things you can configure it here. SNS allows you to group multiple recipient using topic. So whenever you create a topic, you basically create a group uh, here, in which group you can add multiple recipient. A topic is an access point to allow a recipient to dynamically subscribe for identical copies of the same notification. So once you have subscribed to this endpoint, you get a notification now. Benefits of SNS: instantaneous push-based delivery. SQS is a pull-based, and this is a push-based uh, delivery. Simple API and easy integration with all the application. You can just copy the ARN of that endpoint, and you can put into your application, which then be used uh, to send the notification. Now, flexible message delivery over multiple transport protocol that you can send it to multiple devices, multiple protocols, email, SMS, etc. It is inexpensive with pay-as-you-go model with no upfronts. Uh, you pay only for the amount of uh, transactions you have made to a number of requests that you send. Based on that, you need to pay only for that. Now, this is a pricing which may be different from different to different regions, but in general, these are the normal the range of a pricing. User pay fifty cent per one million SNS requests. It's just only point zero zero point zero six per uh, one life notification delivered over HTTP. Seventy five cent per hundred notification delivered over SMS. So SMS charges are a little high. And two dollar per ten one lakh notification uh, over email. So this is the general uh, you know pricing model. This may differ from different regions, but in general this is a pricing model. So we have a lab session on SNS here where I will show you how to create a uh, SNS topic and you can get a subscribe to that topic. SNS. Okay. 
okay so this is my sns dashboard and it says that uh, there are three topics and five subscription already there let's just click on here and these are the three topics the topics is nothing but uh, a subject to your email service a subject uh, when you want to trigger this kind of uh, you know notification there may be a different different uh, topics one topic if auto scaling is down one topic whenever you uh, get upload whenever a new file is uploaded to your s3 so based on this configuration based on this you can create multiple uh, topics and then you can send onto a particular number of recipient so for uh, whenever you resume like, uh, how to create a topic what all it yeah. Can... yeah yeah i'll just show you uh, but the thing is uh, so for example like whenever you have multiple uh, recipient in your developer team who wants to just have access to the s3 so whenever anything is happened to the sc you should get notified so you can create a separate topic for that whatever the ec2 instance who are the people who are dealing for the ec2 instance if they are having any kind of issue then you can create a separate topic separate uh, recipient and you can deliver this kind of mail to that particular topic so this is different than the alarms right sorry once again in the alarms also we'll get notified right yeah for the alarms also the same topic will be used you can create a separate topic for that whatever the number of recipient you want to add you can add and all the recipient will get the same notification at the same time now to create a topic click on create topic and here you can give the name let's say this is uh, for s3 put now these are completely optional thing if you want to encrypt this uh, sns bar you can put, put it here if you want to deny any policy or uh, if you want to restrict any particular user to access the service you can deny it here so here i can choose only the topic owner that if i am creating by this uh, root account then this topic owner is only allowed to create this kind of topic and publish a message okay so it's for the publish or is for notification like let's say there's a developer team and they want to get notified no no this is for the publish one and this is for the subscription so who want to publish a message so like here you can select a, anyone like if you have multiple people in your team you can do it here or also you can what you can do here you can specify any aws or what you can do here is you can customize your own policy and in the principal section what you can do you can uh, give the arn of your group for example you have a developer group in which you have 10 participants so you can provide the uh, list of uh, you can provide the arn of that group so all this may people will be able to communicate to this sns uh, they will be able to publish this message via this sns endpoint so here you can configure that part and who can subscribe to this that is any aws account who can subscribe to this part then delivery retry policy if you are not uh, getting the request uh, if that uh, you know uh, if the message delivery over the http endpoint is not successful so how frequently you want to uh, retry the policy how frequently you want to retry that part you can maintain it here status logging whenever uh, whenever you send sns notification so if you want to maintain this kind of login feature then you can make uh, you can maintain it here and finally the sns role that is you need to attach a role uh, so that this sns can be a integrated part of other aws services for example if you want to send a notification from s3 to sns then you need to create a, that particular role here and once it is role is created then sc will be able to send or uh, to trigger to sns correct we require a role to to connect two different services correct right uh, correct neeraj yeah so for our this kind of thing we can let amazon to create a role or if we have anything we don't have create a role and this time let's say create an sns role name or uh, let's do one thing we'll create our own role here saying that here we'll choose the s3 service but s3 can send a notification to the uh, sns so here we'll select the s3 
next create policy let's say sns full access next tag if you want to add s3 notify sms and create a role so if you have created one role s3 notify sns now this role we can attach i am role so just copy this role arm and paste it here okay now hit on create topic now a topic has been created which says the s3 pool whenever uh, we get a message on the s3 this kind of people will be get notification so now to whom and where you want to deliver this notification so for that you need to create a subscription create subscription and now here you can select the protocol this is where you want to deliver this kind of request http https email sqs lambda etc let's say email here i can provide my email address do you want to also get notified so i can add your notification sure yeah you can uh, you get one notification that is subscription confirmation uh, just let me know your email id let me paste in the chat So now you will also get one notification and you need to click on confirm uh, you can see here there is a pending confirmation so you need to click on that confirm subscription and once then you will get this kind of notification that the subscription is confirmed once this notification is confirmed now you can just go back to the sns and just refresh this page copy as the report now you can see both of these endpoints has been successfully confirmed now if i want to publish any messages i can do on uh, that is subject which is optional let's say what i'm trying to do that is uh, and the message Okay. and click on publish message so the number of recipient who has confirmed this subscription will now get one email that saying that hi whatever that message we have sent will get the and here you can see hi welcome to the aws code hope you have enjoyed thanks and if you want to stop this notification then you can unsubscribe with this endpoint etc now here you can see you get notification from aws notification say that no reply as that at sns amazon.com but whenever you send this application whenever you send uh, this kind of notification via scs service at that time you will get from your own domain name whatever the domain name that you have configured sales at the red domain uh, notification at the red domain product at the red domain whatever it is you get the notification from that email address so this is sns how to create a topic and once it is created how you can configure this part any question is far so this is basically used for all the marketing purpose and for sending the i mean no no this cannot be used for the marketing purpose because you get the email from amazon dns right amazon domain so this is not a good solution when you are sending uh, for your production uh, product uh, you know marketing purposes 
this is only when you want to get a push notification if any kind of action is happened if you want to get notified when any kind of event is occurred on your infrastructure for that purpose only this sns is useful for all the marketing and transactional purposes you should go with the scs okay no but you created the message right but you didn't create any event right i mean like what yeah, kind of this is, this is just a demo where i have created this kind of uh, published messages because we have set uh, email service so we can publish a message mm -hmm. now okay. we have created role that is from s3 you can configure so let's go to the s3 and check okay like s3 port right yeah exactly so if any kind of file is has been uploaded to my this kind of training bucket let's say uh, events add notification so if any kind of port, post copy any kind of this kind of event has been occurred any name here so send to sns topic select the arn add sns topic arn and here i can paste now one thing uh, this won't be accepted because our uh, sns has been created in mumbai region and our bucket is in singapore region so it will not accept it save the notification region needs to be changed so as you bucket create a bucket demo training as sns and i will create in mumbai region which now to this uh, bucket i can configure the event add notification name on port post send notification endpoint once you click here you see all the uh, all the sns endpoint directly so the one that we have created is the s3 put or right you can click on save now now if i just hit enter any kind of file here so i get one notification saying that this kind of event has been created that is demo bucket for your demo bucket uh, first of all first mail that you will receive will say that your demo bucket uh, is attached to your uh, notification system and the second email that you will receive saying that the description of that object so here event version 2.1 event source aws s3 region ap south 1 time that is the current time when it was uploaded what is the event name that is object created the file type is put user identity uh, basically is a principal id which is my access key id request parameter that is a source ip from which source the file is being uploaded then there is some response element that is a tag and the token service and here if you go a little down then the s3 arn of the s3 bucket that is demo training aws and the object here is the name of the object that is xy33 3443.jpg so the file name that i have uploaded xy3443.jpg the name of that file the size of that file in bytes 2491 everything whatever you have you will get a notification out of it okay yeah now this is a very uh, raw data right you, this is not in the very good readable format so what you can do is whenever you get one notification uh, whenever you uh, you know trigger this kind of s3 event you can trigger it to um, lambda and this kind of message will be sent now to the lambda right now on the lambda part you can just write a small script that will change the way uh, that you see here the text it will simply show you the name of the file the size of the file when it is uploaded and the uh, mm -hmm. source ID. basically you can extract this kind of information and yeah. put into the more readable format and then like, send back like to the estimate format right estimate right right you can um, do it more uh, readable format and then you can set 
So all these things that you can customize, this is completely up to you. So any question, any doubt in this uh, course? I'm not. Okay. So you can you just uh, it it will take another ten minutes. Uh, do you have that extra time in this now? So we can complete a small part about the uh, you know web application framework. Uh, sorry, the well architecture framework. So so today will be the last class. Yeah, we have completed everything now. Okay, I think CloudFront was also remaining, right? Uh, CloudFront. Uh, yeah, sure, we can see. Okay. So let's see the well architecture framework. So why do uh, sorry, this is not the one. Okay, this is. So what are the parameters where you can define what is the well architecture framework whenever you design an infrastructure on the cloud? So the well architecture framework helps the architects, uh, architects like you to build more secure, high performing and infra uh, efficient infrastructure possible. So it gives you all the description, all the ways that you can uh, design your infrastructure in most uh, secured way in high performing, that is high ability and the fault tolerant web application. General design guidelines, that is you need to stop guessing your capacity. What will be your future uh, expectation? How many users will be having you in the uh, in upcoming future? You need to stop that part. I need to, to focus on what is your current demand. Based on your current customer, you need to design your infrastructure because AWS offer you whenever you want to upgrade the size, you can do it. Automate to make, uh, make experience better. That is, you can put everything automation like SNS, SES, Lambda, Cloud Formation, Alarm, and then auto scaling. You can use this automation part to make your experience better. Test your system. Whenever you have designed your infrastructure, you can have a uh, you can create your own test environments, and then you can uh, first study and have a look how and, and with worst cases your infrastructure gets failed. So based on this thing, you can test your infrastructure, and based on this failure. You can improve your through game days. Now, game day is something like if your infrastructure is in auto scaling mode, right? Then your your application is something the, that the user has to your application that user interacts with your application just only for the four hours a day. That is, let's say from 9 a.m. to evening 5 p.m. You are just uh, you are dealing with the government side. And most of the pieces that uh, that uh, history of website is from morning 9 a.m. to evening 5 p.m. So you can design your infrastructure in such a way that uh, by the 8:30, 8 or 8:30, your system will be uh, you know double or triple. Your infrastructure size will be double or triple, and it will be long till 5:30 or 6 p.m. And then after 6 p.m., you will have a very minimal number of servers. That is one server or two servers just to have your server running, to have your website running. But during the time of the period when you have maximum amount of requests uh, for your application, at that time you can double or triple your infrastructure. So what are the benefits that you will get is first, your customer will have a very good experience when dealing with your website, uh, when dealing with your application during the daytime. And during the night time when there is a very low less uh, lead at that time, you have a minimum number of servers so that you can save your cost. You don't need to run uh, the same infrastructure throughout the day 24 hours. You can just manage this kind of things. So this is called as game days. So AWS well Architecture framework depends on five pillars. First, operation excellence. That is ability to run and monitor your system to deliver business value and to continually improve supporting process and procedure. Now, when we talk about the microservices, so microservices is a service set which adopt other services easily to your environment like a Paytm wallet or uh, the you know the other application that will be whenever new feature is coming that we able to indicate easily so your application should be designed in such a way that whenever a new product or new uh, feature that you are rolling out it should be accepted it should be easily integrated to your existing application Security, the ability to protect information system assets while delivering business value. 
through risk assessment and mitigation strategies. Like you should have a strategies like uh, design, while designing your infrastructure, all the things should be considered. The security group, the NACAS, the AWS, CloudTrail, CloudWatch, this kind of things that you need to maintain. Reliability, the ability of your system to recover from infrastructure or service disruption. So you need to design in such a way that uh, it should have a automatic uh, you know, backup strategies or whatever the recovering options they have. So you, ha you must have, you need to design your system in two ability zone that AWS recommends to you that in case in uh, there is a failure in the one data center, then the other data center will be helpful. Performance efficiency, the ability to use computing resources efficiently to meet the uh, system requirement and to maintain the efficiency as demand changes and technology evolve. Similar to the just uh, just now scenario that we have seen for the game day, you can uh, with this kind of strategy you can maintain your performance whenever it is required, and when it is not required you can save your cost. And the last is the cost optimization, the ability to run system to deliver business value at the lowest possible cost. So when we said if at the night time you don't have a uh, you know maximum number of requests or you have very minimum number of requests or you need to run just your application during the night time at that time you have very small infrastructure so during that period you are actually saving your cost and secondly when we say you are saving your cost exactly it means that you are saving your business money so whatever you are paying for the three servers running for the 24 hours now you will pay for one server for the running when from 6 p.m. to early morning 8 p.m. So during this prayer you can save your two servers cost which you can use to uh, you know do investment on your future projects or you can use for your business value so it will increase your business productivity for a business value with this cost optimization solution. First is operational excellence. So design principles for option, uh, operation excellence is perform operation as a code that is design your infrastructure as a code via cloud formation. So in case in future, if any new features you want to uh, create, then you can also include that part in your code. Make frequent, small and reversible changes. So whatever you do, that uh, changes should be, uh, you know, frequently and what means that, uh, that changes, whatever you do, should be able to accept the current system. Refine operation procedure frequently, anticipate failure, where whenever this kind of failure is occur, you need to anticipate such kind of thing, and learn from the failures and do all the operation failure, learn from all the operation failures. So whatever you uh, you see, like uh, we have seen the scenario that if you are getting a request at uh, 9 p.m. and you start your infrastructure double table at 8 a.m., so you need to see all these things. If uh, it, it, uh, we start our servers, all the entire infrastructure, then how long it takes to come up with the entire infrastructure. If it takes only five to 10 minutes, then you can do at 8.30 on Android. So this is, a, you can just try an error. This is a part of try and error, and you can use the service to work on it. Then the second is the security. That is implement a strong identity for foundation that is using an IAM service. You can enable a strong identity foundation. Enable traceability from cloud trail. You can enable traceability, whatever the APIs that will your developers will be make. Uh, you will get all the information here. Apply security at all layers, at the EC2 instance, at the access control list, everywhere. Protect data in transit and address from by encrypting your data. Keep people away from the data. That is, uh, you need to put uh, all the termination protection and you need to uh, apply the, all the automation whenever required so that you uh, you keep away people from uh, any human intervention. Prepare from security events. So with the cloud watch events, you can create an alarm. So whenever any kind of thing is have occurred, you can just throw the notification. So you can create such kind of events. Whenever such kind of incidents is occurred, you will get notified for that. The reliability. Test recovery procedures automatically recover from failure, scale horizontally to increase aggregator system in, uh, ability. Again, this is a part of well architecture framework that you need to design your always system with horizontally scale capacity. You should not go for the vertical one. You should always go with uh, horizontally. Stop guessing capacity, whatever is your current demand, you need to go accordingly. Manage change in automation. 
whatever the change you do in the automation you need to keep it changing and you should test all these kind of features performance efficiency that is democratize uh, advanced technology whatever the new technology you are implementing you need to stop uh, using such kind of application that will support this kind of application basically aws provides its own managed service so you can use this uh, you can leverage these services to design your infrastructure like big data machine learning artificial intelligence iot aws provides its own uh, managed services so you can use these services to provide you more efficient and uh, cost-effective solution to your business. Grow global in minutes with AWS Cloud with uh, this kind of features. You can uh, connect to any server whenever you want. Use serverless architecture. Basically, serverless architecture are one of the most cost-effective solution and one of the most uh, advanced uh, thing is uh, present at the moment. So you can use this serverless architecture more and more experiment and more often. So whatever you do experiment, you will learn from that and you can design uh, more effective product for your next application. So this uh, is what uh, this. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, this serverless feature is like unique to Amazon, or it also have like um, I mean the other cloud solution like Azure or Google Cloud. Uh, also we like didn't have at the moment. This kind of peer, this kind of vendors are still working on it to provide you such kind of options. Like Google is uh, last uh, month they have notified that we are also coming with the serverless part. But still they are working on it you will get in the upcoming months okay and azure doesn't have it yeah to the best of my knowledge uh, they don't have okay so they don't have like this lambda kind of functionality no uh, they don't have this is okay. a feature that is rolled out first by the aws only okay and even if the pricing model with the cloud google cloud azure and the aws you will find that aws whatever the service that they are offering the computing capacity and for what they are offering is always a cheaper option. Okay, but there okay. must be some unique features, right? Which should be. Uh... Uh, yeah, basically most of the people which go for the Azure is uh, when they are uh, dealing with the ESP.NET kind of application. If they have, they will go. Uh, they will get a very good, um, you know, response from that kind of uh, public cloud, Azure cloud. Okay, like like SharePoint Online or Office 365. Yes. So that's yes. Microsoft technologies, right? They go well with Azure. Yeah, for the Microsoft product, uh, this is kind of application is very good public cloud, Azure. Okay. So the fifth one is a cost optimization. That is adopt a consumption model. Whatever is your current consumption model, you need to uh, adopt that, and based on that, you need to design your system. Major overall efficiency. You need to uh, with the cloud was service you can measure your overall efficiency overall uh, you know utilization of your services and your if the ec2 instance you have one, let's consider you have an ec2 instance which you, which doesn't never goes to the more than 40 percent of the utilization so in such case what you can do you can just decrease the size of that uh, ec2 instance type so that you will get less charge for that uh, part now you can also try this. You can always, whenever uh, you get the request from the client that you need to uh, buy a server or you need to create a server for that, what you can do at that time, you can just create a small server, test that application, how uh, how much utilization they get in our real time uh, life thing. And those based on that, you can now change the instance type. So that will be a more good option. Stop spending money on data centers operation. Like you don't need to now buy, a, you don't need to buy a place to create your data center, all the racks of spaces, storage, and etc. You can use this Amazon uh, service to create a data center, uh, to create an infrastructure. Analyze and attribute expenditure. Use manage and application level services to reduce the cost. Again, it's always a good practice whenever you design an infrastructure on the cloud, AWS cloud. You should always use the AWS managed services, what they are offering to avoid the whatever the configuration and the owner ownership of that particular resource. So that's it for the web uh, well architecture framework. And what we left is the cloud front. So do you know exactly the what is the use case of a cloud front? We have discussed multiple times, right? 
Yeah, I guess uh, that is during the uh, S3 storage when we try to do the cross replication of the object across regions. So no, that no, no. cache the data like something. Yeah, but uh, replication doesn't involve. Yeah, replication somewhere involves the edge location use of edge location, but it doesn't use the CloudFront technology. CloudFront is a technology which uh, leverages the edge locations of AWS to cache their data. So, so it's basically for content delivery network, right? Yeah, okay. Right. A content delivery network uses a network of servers in geographical dispersed location, that is each location, to cache cop uh, copies of your content close to your end user. So for example, if I have created a server of, if I have created, uploaded a video, which needs to be accessed from entire world, so what I can do, I can just enable the CDN network for that particular video file or for, uh, for that particular ST bucket or anything. Now, whenever users, uh, whenever users uh, request to that information to that particular file, that information will be cached into their regional location. If people are trying to access from US, then they will get, uh, you know, cached to their regional location. People from UK will be get cached to their regional location. So what will happen next time whenever any other person will try to access the data, they will get information from their cache location. Now, we have seen in the essay that is static web hosting. That is, you can only upload a static data there. But this cloud fund is, uh, with, with this cloud fund, you can send both the static and the dynamic data. You can enable this kind of feature. So whenever a specific page file or program is executed by a user, the server dynamically select the delivery to content of is based on the closest network proximity or the one with the fewest network hooks to the end user. So whatever the low latency network is possible, available from the end user to that particular each location or the server, it will be sent directly from there. Content is replicated across the each location, thereby providing redundancy. Now, content is replicated across the each location, which means within the region, particular region, it will be replicated. In India, we have five each locations. So all this, whenever or whenever the content is uh, cached, it will be cached to all this five region. But it will never will cache to the Singapore region, to the US region, to the UK region at that time. Whenever a particular uh, person uh, requests that video from its own region, that region will be cached uh, that data will be cached in all the regions. So how it works? Basically, you can connect this cloud front to your S3 bucket or EC2 instance to get the data. So for example, this is me, user, and this is server, which is on the world, wherever it is. So whenever I request this get data or uh, get to the file, it basically uh, checks to the cloud front network whether this cloud front uh, has the data or not. If it has a data, then it will send back to my uh, back to me. If it don't have the data, then it will send the request to the S3 to fetch the data, and it will then fetch the data. But what happens when you talk about the dynamic data? So for the dynamic data, always, uh, whenever a user requests to uh, some kind of information to the CloudFront, that CloudFront always checks this kind of data, that is whatever the data it has, and the data that is uploaded to your SC and EC instances, if there is a change within this two uh, version, then it will check. If there is any upgradation in that version, then it will fetch the data again, and it will then send to the user. If the data is sent, if the if the, if the data is same, then it will pass the 200 code, that is status check success code, that is there is no change in the data, and the same copy of that uh, each location will be sent to this user. So technically, whenever a user requests to your any kind of data, uh, let's say a data is uploaded to youtube.com. Okay, whenever uh, you see a file, it always go to the CloudFront network. CloudFront checks whether the data is available in your each location or not. If it is available, then it will check whether that data is same as the original data or there is upgradation in the data. If there is any upgradation in the data, then it will fetch from the so, uh, source information, source location, and then it will pass to the user. If the data is same as the source, then it will send directly from its age location to this kind of user. So this is how it works. Like here you can see, whenever first user requests, 
it sends an acknowledgement request then you from the cloud front you get the acknowledgement now if that data is not present then from cloud front now then sends a uh, synchronization request to the regions uh, where the, your data is stored that is your ec2 instance you get one acknowledgement and then you back send the acknowledgement which file you want and if you want that index.jpg file, JSP file, you request that file, and then it reaches to that cloud front, which is then sent to the user. So if it, for the entire process, if it takes 400 milliseconds, so once uh, for the first time, it will take 400 milliseconds, let's assume. So next time what will happen, whenever second user requests that file, it will send a synchronization request, the synchronizer acknowledgement it will receive, then from, with this acknowledgement, it will request this index.php that I want this index.php. CloudFront checks whether that index.php is available or not. Basically, the user one has just requested, so this CloudFront must have this kind of index.jsp page. So it will just check whether that index.jsp uh, change uh, JSP page is changed from its uh, first version or not. If that if it receives the same status that is success code, then it will pass the same file otherwise it will again fetch the new file and it will upload it to the cloud front and then it will save now for this you can say for a second person for a second user connecting to the cloud front network it will take a 20 milliseconds and whatever the response you get it will take for here so eight milliseconds so within this 100 millisecond the second user will get the data which can be one fourth of from the first user now this kind of uh, you know latency is not exactly available based on the latency current how far is from that location your region to that particular location how far it is based on that it matters but definitely from first user the second user will get in less number of time cloud uh, front components that is uh, two components that is first is distribution a distribution can be of two types that is a cloud front uh, distribution which is uh, provided by the aws so for example like whenever you request your particular file you get this kind of uh, domain name that is your file name dot cloudfront.net that you use as this cloudfront.net which is provided by the aws and you want to, whenever you want to have a specific uh, with your uh, domain that is origin dot example dot whatever the file name it is dot example dot name so this is extra payable, extra chargeable. At that time you need to buy also register that domain to your AWS and then you need to configure everything. And then this is something that is extra chargeable comparatively to CloudFront.net. So this is something. But this is something that is not, doesn't matter because this is completely backend. But some companies require to use their own, uh, you know, system. So they will use this origin.example.com. Use cases to accelerate your website, to deliver your content in much faster way, stream live or on-demand media, customize user experience, like whatever the requests are, whatever the users enter the data will be easily be customized here, and you will get a secure contents. So all the transaction, all the data that you see on the browser, on your media services, that is again based on the what kind of uh, security related features that you provide the security SSL certificate and all the things. So this is last one. Now we have completed the entire course, right? Okay. Uh, so Lilith, uh, can you talk a little bit about the certification? Like if I give the certification like a solution architect, so how should I prepare? Like is this uh, whatever we went through is enough or I have to focus on like yeah. specific? Yeah, yeah. So whatever the training we have given, uh, that is sufficient. But you need to focus on understanding all the concepts. Once again, you need to go through a little uh, theoretical plus uh, hands-on lab on it. The more you do hands-on lab, you will be get, uh, you know, uh, much clear, clear clarification on how to create a resources and when to use which resource. So this is very important. You should at least spend 10 days uh, on studying all the different concepts of the AWS, whatever we have seen, VPC, EC2, all the things. And then after 10 days of quiz study, then you can prepare for, uh, then you can go for the examination. Now, while going to the examination, few things that certain resource services are very important, like EC2, S3, it, uh, VPC, then uh, 
this cloud fund can be a good part of it then sqs lambda then elastic bin stock and uh, CloudWatch service. So these are the certain services that most of the questions are based on. You will get notification. You will get a scenario based on these services. Majority of the services will be this one. And to the other services that we have seen, uh, you will get a one or two question. That's it. Ninety percent of the question will be based on the uh, scenario. They will give you small set of their company. Uh, there is one company who has this kind of infrastructure. What kind of solution you have? There is a question based on the troubleshooting. Now, to for the most of the country, you will be able to understand the scenario. And you will be able to answer the thing. Why, when you have a theoretical knowledge of it, when you study the AWS documentation and the white papers, etc. But for the troubleshooting purposes, 10% uh, of the questions are based on the troubleshooting in the exam. So, for the troubleshooting purposes, you need to have good hands-on practice on the AWS, how to create the resources, what are the configuration options you have, etc. So at that time, you can use our recordings to again have a look on this kind of things, and you can retry all this uh, AWS hands-on labs. So do they, guys, ask, uh, do they ask like uh, all these troubleshooting questions? Like what are the configurations available? Everything like. I uh, know they will ask like uh, there is a problem with the uh, application load balancer. Then so like uh, whenever I hit to the application, whenever user hit to the application, uh, the request is not uh, successful. But if uh, I try to uh, you know put uh, whenever whenever I request from the browser on that particular web server that IP address. It get accepted. So, what would be the possible, uh, you know, reason behind it? So, they will have four question. Uh, there will be a minor question based on the. There will be a solution based on the security group that you can check. Such kind of uh, troubleshooting questions will be there. Like certain things are not working. So, how will you configure that part? How will you troubleshoot that part? These are the general uh, troubleshooting ideas. Okay, so do, do you have that uh, slide uh, in, in the first session which talks about different certification? So if I want to proceed um, Like uh, the solution architect is the first level, right? Yeah uh, So this kind of course is definitely very helpful for solution architect. like you will have now a very good knowledge about designing your infrastructure, right? You know now multiple services in networking, storage, uh, computing power, then application services, security, uh, cloud watch, monitoring, etc. So, with this kind of broad information, you can go with a solution architect. For a developer, you will require to have a, you know knowledge about few more services, uh, code commit, code build, kind of things. Okay, so a developer course is the is the next level, or it, sysops is the second level. Uh, no, all the associate level are at the same level. The solution architect associate level, developer associate level, and the sysop are at the same level. But the services and the question that you get are different. Now, based on our course and whatever the service that we have seen, it will be very easy for you to create the solution architect. For the developer, you will require more knowledge on the code comic, CI, CD, etc. How to deploy the code that is important. For a sysop, you will require to have a knowledge how to monitor all the different AWS services, how to create an incident report, etc. So this is more on uh, working with the IAM service, how to monitor your service, how to administer your AWS account. Okay. 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 So once you get certified, so how long is that uh, certification valid? And I mean. Uh, previously, it was just for two years. It is valid only for two years, but recently, last month. They have rolled out a new feature that now, uh, from now, this certification is valid for the next three years. Three years, okay. So, and the cost of this associate level certification is one fifty dollars. Okay, so we have to go to the testing center, or we can do it like online. You need to go to the test center. There's a curating test centers in your region. You need to, whenever you go, go for the registration of your certification. You will get uh, whenever you provide your location, you will get the number of test centers available in that particular region, in that particular nearby you. You can select one of them and you can place your date. Okay. So once you get certified, right? So you can apply for like this kind of jobs, like cloud architect job or. Um, 
how this Without like also you can apply for the job it doesn't matter like most of the companies do not get preferred to have a certification but they do validate your knowledge like how many they will give you a good scenario they, they will conduct an interview and they will ask you many questions on designing and implementing that kind of uh, infrastructure on the cloud so at the time if you have that kind of good knowledge about the aws then you can just directly go for the job and if you are not comfortable with that environment then you can go for the certification you can get a certification and then you can tell this i am not certified so it will be more easy path okay but, but then most of on the professional uh, level right uh, but uh, most of but it's not like without certification you cannot have a job without certification also you can get a job this is just a, you need to do a little struggle you need to prove yourself that you are having a very good knowledge about the aws that's it okay so just being in like a what like cloud architect what's the title like what they look for yeah you will get title with a solution uh, cloud engineer or associate cloud engineer okay even if you get a certification you will get the same profile because you have a less uh, number of uh, experience in this cloud so you will be first working as a so cloud engineer or associate cloud engineer whatever the profile they are offering Mm -hmm. And then a very good, uh, you know, experience at least two years of experience. Then you will be titled as a as a principal cloud engineer or a solution architect, based on whatever the profile that the company gives. Okay, and once you do like a DevOps, so is it like the same or will it gonna change? Like DevOps, uh, it will be like a DevOps engineer, associate DevOps engineer. Okay, but DevOps is generally like like any kind of devops right but when we talk in terms yeah. of cloud to uh, have a knowledge upon the ci cd how to deploy your code into the aws infrastructure and the second how to operate that code so uh, when we have an associate level certification of developers and the sysop it gets a combination of both the service so which is better like combination solution arc with devops or solution arc with sysops uh, this is completely on your interest. Like, if you are interested to go with the solution architect only, if you are interested to design a uh, more AWS architect, like taking the requirement from the customer, working on it, then creating an infrastructure. If you like this path, then you can go with the associate solution architect to professional level. If you would like to more on the creating a resource and maintaining that resource kind of thing, at that time you can go with the developer and then you can go with the DevOps okay so okay so you you can you can uh, uh you can go to the professional level from solution architect associate yeah. and devops associate yeah there is no actually path available you can offer uh, even if you want to have direct access to or if you want to directly give the exam of a professional level solution architect then also you can give but the difference will be like the questions are more tough and the more complex and you require that much of good knowledge Okay. Okay. Anything else? Whatever. If you have any doubt, you can just uh, post me a message. I will try to help you as much as I. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll try to practice the lab in case I stuck with any issues. I'll yeah. just you know. Let me know. When you start, yeah. What is your activity? I'll help you. Right, right. And you, you already sent me the course content for the day off, right? Uh, I just forgot to do that. I will do it today. Actually, I'm continuously busy doing uh, for a corporate training. Uh, okay. I'll do it today or tomorrow. By tomorrow, you will get the entire list of course content and what we are actually looking in the developer part. Okay, and you also have the SysOps or you only teach DevOps? Uh, no, SysOps also. All the three associate level certification. You do, okay. So for professional level, you don't, right? Uh, professional basically uh, nobody goes for the professional certification like if you have a good experience in the pro uh, in the aws then you are sufficient enough to go and crack the exam so most of the people don't prefer to have extra training oh okay so you was with the experience you can do it by yourself yeah by the experience itself you can just write the examination got it okay okay sounds good sounds good all right thanks lalit thanks for all your time and thanks for all your sharing all your information I appreciate Thank it. Yeah. Yeah. If you have any uh, if you want to have this kind of training, uh, you can just let them know directly.